Welcome to Greater Than Sudoku, a type of Sudoku that's even harder than the killer Sudokus that you're probably used to. You'll notice that there isn't a single number on the grid, only these arrows linking cells. When you start to fill the grid with numbers, normal Sudoku rules apply, of course. As you watch this video, you might find it useful to pause and rewind it at various stages, as these things can start to get complicated quite quickly. The arrows are greater than signs, or less than signs, depending on how you look at them. And they work in the same way as in maths, with the point of the arrow pointing to the smaller of the two numbers. The more of these signs there are on the grid, the easier it is to solve. Unlike maths, the signs can operate vertically as well as horizontally, and in most puzzles, you'll find, don't bridge from one 3x3 three three group to another. Of course, there can be no equal sign between cells, as any two cells that share an edge cannot contain the same number. While it's tempting simply to try different numbers to see what works, there is a more methodical approach, involving filling in the grid with possible digits and then whittling them away, and I've put the digits 1 to 9 in the middle group on the top row. Now we whittle. Take a look at the two cells ringed. The top cell is larger than the bottom one. We can't tell what they contain, but we know the top cell can't contain 1, and the bottom cell can't contain 9, so we can remove these. Now consider the cell marked in yellow. We know that it is bigger than the cell directly above it, and the one directly to the left. But look at that cell on the left a bit more closely. It is bigger than the cell below it, which in turn is bigger than the cell to its right. In total, there are four cells, which must be smaller than the cell in yellow. The smallest digit that the yellow cell can contain is therefore 5. We can't be certain that it does contain 5, only that it can't contain anything smaller. Similarly, the cell to the left of the yellow one can't contain a digit less than 3, as there are two cells smaller than it, and the one below that can't contain a digit less than 2. We can form a descending chain of four cells, removing different numbers of digits from each cell as we move along it. Of course, the process works for the higher end digits as well. Consider this cell in the corner. This is at the end of the chain, with three cells that we know must contain digits bigger than it. Therefore, this cell can't contain anything bigger than 6. The cell to its left can't contain anything bigger than a 7, and the one above that nothing bigger than an 8. It's tempting to include the cell in the top right-hand corner in this chain, but we can't, as the arrow joining it to the others is pointing the wrong way for our purposes. We can't conclude anything about that top right cell, other than that it is smaller than the one directly below it, so can't contain a 9. We have no idea how it compares to the other three cells in the chain. After all that slicing away, the group looks like this, and already it's beginning to look a little more manageable. You'll also notice that there are two cells about which we know nothing, yet. This leads us to two rules, which apply to any cells joined directly by an arrow. One of those cells must be bigger than the other. The first rule is that the smallest digit in the smaller cell must be less than the smallest digit in the bigger cell. The other is that the largest digit in the smaller cell must be less than the largest digit in the bigger cell. In short, that arrow must apply to the digits at the different ends of the ranges in both cells. The group on the top right of the grid, just to the right of where we've been working, contains more arrows, and therefore more scope for removing digits. Take the cell marked in yellow. You can see it must contain a fairly high number. In fact, we can construct chains of cells which must contain digits smaller than the cell in yellow by following the arrows downwards. In creating such a chain, Make sure that you only flow in the same direction as the arrows, never against them. So we can't include the cell in the bottom right-hand corner in the chain. Here I've removed the digits from the tops and bottoms of each cell, according to how many cells there must be which are bigger or smaller than they are. Note that the cell in the top right-hand corner only goes up as far as 5, even though the cells to which it is connected go up as far as 7. This is because it can be reached via two different paths, which increases by 1, how many cells must be larger than it is. And here I've filled in the entire grid using the same logic. Up to now, there's been no inspiration involved, merely the mindless repetition of fixed rules, the sort of thing that a computer would do really well. This might be the reason that greater than Sudoku is less popular than its killer cousin. You have to put in a fair amount of drudge work before you can really start having fun. Here I have extracted the middle three rows from the grid to make it easier to see. Take a look at the cell highlighted in yellow. It is the only cell in that row that can contain a 1, so that must be the number it does contain. 
Hooray, we've tracked down our first cell. At this point, we apply the Sudoku rule that each digit must only appear once in each row, column, and 3x3 three three group. This means that it can be removed from a series of other cells, as shown here in blue. And once we've done that, the grid looks like this. In general, you'll find with greater than Sudokus, you tend to pinpoint the highest and lowest values first, the 1s and the 9s. Then you'll start getting the 2s and 8s, and generally work your way in towards the middle. Setting the cell to 1 will have a knock-on effect on others. Within that same group, we now have two cells that break the rules from before. That cell in the top right corner can't contain a 2 any longer. If that cell did contain a 2, what would the cell to its immediate left contain? Exactly. So we remove it. Take a look at those cells in blue. All three of them must be smaller than the cell in yellow, and yet none of them can contain a 1. The smallest they can be is 2, 3, and 4, and they might well be larger than that. This means that the smallest the yellow cell can possibly be is 5. That's better. From now on, a lot of the elimination is done using normal Sudoku techniques. For instance, these ringed cells in red are the only ones in the middle group that can possibly contain a 1. We don't know which one does, but we do know for certain that the two blue cells can't contain a 1. So we can remove 1 from both of them. Of course, this means that the neighbouring cells might have to be adjusted to conform to the two rules. And in this case, no fewer than three cells have to have digits removed. This is how the puzzle will proceed from now on, with digits being removed as in normal Sudoku, and then the consequences rippling through the rows and columns, and around the chains of cells linked with the arrows. And this is a snapshot of the point we have reached. As you can see, it's just a case of applying the rules of normal Sudoku, plus this extra principle, to make sure the ranges of digits in the cells are compatible with each other. As with all Sudoku puzzles, you might find that a certain degree of inspiration is needed to get over some of the harder parts, but a lot of it is simply applying a standard method. If you want to see me follow the logical steps to complete this puzzle, then you really need to get out more. But you know enough now to finish it for yourselves. Looking at that grid, can you see what the next move will be? If you hang on for a little while, I'll give you a couple of hints. But only after I've plugged Rosemary's book. Ha ha! A captive audience at last. Behold, the Kelpie's Curse, a paranormal horror story set in rural Scotland. Click on the screen to see it on Amazon. I enjoy it, and I think you will too. Right, still with me? Take a look at that middle row. Using normal Sudoku principles, can you spot another digit that you can pin down? Alternatively, consider the penultimate column. Again, you should see one cell that must contain a particular digit. You might want to pause the video at this point to see what I mean.